let's talk about the always hot topic of managing people. Listen, I firmly believe that managers are the linchpin that holds the culture of any organization together. Because if you have a good experience with your manager, you're probably going to have a better experience with the organization. On the flip side, if you have a horrible experience with your manager, well, nothing your organization does from a broader cultural perspective will ever be good enough. Now, yesterday I went through Achievers retention and engagement report for 2020. And what they found, it's actually really interesting. In last year's report, what they found is that a significant number of employees were staying in their jobs, not because they were happy, but because they were like, meh, I don't really want to look for a new one. This year, they found that employees aren't that complacent anymore. As many as 64% of employees may leave their job this year. And so we have to really start getting our act together in the way that we're managing people to be able to provide those great, fulfilling work experiences that people don't want to leave. Now, a few quick announcements before we get started. I'm going to be going through some data about people management and really interesting information from the predictive index. But before we get started, few quick things. Now, you may not have heard, but I'm going to be having a free webinar on February 13th about my manager training program called Manager Mastery, the ultimate manager training program. I call it the ultimate manager training program because I've implemented this in all types of organizations with all different types of people with managers of all different types of experience levels. When people do what I tell them to do, they see their team productivity increase as much as 30% just by changing the way they're working together. So if you want more information about that, head over to zenworkplace.com. It'll take you right to a link to register totally for free. The other thing I want to say is, listen, just a reminder, these, these videos that I'm doing are a little bit of a new thing for me. I'm really trying to see if there's an audience for it, if it's something that you guys like. If you like the content I'm putting out there, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, give it a thumbs up, share it on your social media accounts with other people that might be interested in this type of content, leave a comment, do all sorts of things to let me know that this is good because if you guys like it, I'm going to keep doing it. All right, let's dig into our data. This is the 2019 People Management Report from Predictive Index, and this is actually a relatively new report from August 2019, where they conducted a survey of over a thousand managers from 13 different, or a thousand employees rather, from 13 different industries to find out how their managers are doing. Let's dig right into it. Number one, there are subtle ways managers sabotage their teams. The media portrays bad bosses as bullied, self-centered, quick to anger, and happy to berate employees, usually in front of others. Employees tend to paint similar traits, point to similar traits. In 2018 People Management Study, they found that bad-mouthing people behind their backs and playing favorites were two of the top five most common traits of terrible managers. But in reality... There are plenty of bad bosses that are much harder to spot. This study sought to uncover the ways in which managers, managers subtly sabotage their teams. To this end, a panel of over a thousand, we've already talked about that. They've got this quote here from Amy Edmondson, who is, you know, if you hear the term psychological safety thrown around, and you hear it thrown around an awful lot, especially with studies related to what Google has done, Amy Edmondson is actually the person that coined the term psychological safety. So she says, psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. So clearly that's going to be a prominent part of this report. The data shows that good managers create more psychologically safe working environments. It also shows the subtle ways managers sabotage their teams and destroy their psychological safety. While there aren't outright displays of mistreatment, they still negatively impact the employee experience. For example, 96% of employees with good managers feel they can approach their boss with problems. Just 43% of employees with bad managers feel the same. So let's look at this. I can approach my manager with problems or tough issues. People with good managers versus the orange with people in bad with bad managers. The first question I have is how did they assess a good manager or a bad manager? Is this they just ask a question like I like my boss versus I don't something like that. I mean perception matters at the end of the day. Listen you could have the best boss in sliced bread but if all everyone on the team is saying I hate my boss they're a bad manager. You know, they're going to react and build their relationship with that manager based on that perception. And listen, there might be some there there to it. There are reasons why people say these things. 
People with good managers say, I often get frustrated with my managers 10%. People with bad managers, 80%. For people with good managers, they are very likely to say my manager values my unique skills, where only 20% of people with bad managers agree with that. And my manager respects my personal values, even if they disagree. 88% of people with good managers and 25% of people with bad managers. Finding number two, people who feel psychologically safe are less likely to quit, huh? So let's think about that in relation to the achievers data that I gave you yesterday that says that as many as 64% of employees might leave their job in 2020. Next, this study sought to examine the relationship between psychological safety and turnover intent. Researchers found a correlation between the way people rated the 14 psychological safety statements and turnover intent. Employees who feel psychologically safe are less likely to look for work elsewhere. With the war for top talent raging, establishing a psychologically safe environment should be a top priority for a business leader who seeks to retain high performers. To uncover this, respondents were asked to rate the following statements on a scale of 1, for strongly disagree, to 5, strongly agree. I am likely to look for work at another organization in the next 12 months. Researchers compared that answer to this question with responses to the 14 statements related to psychological safety. Across the board, researchers found a relationship between turnover intent and psychological safety. This, this should really be no surprise there. Listen, yesterday in my video, I talked about trust and trust being foundational to any organization or working group's success. Now, psychological safety and trust are pretty, pretty linked. If you have trust, you are probably going to have stronger degrees of psychological safety and vice versa. That's really what we're talking about. Are people, do people feel comfortable that their manager is going to have their back? Do people feel comfortable that their manager is going to support them even if they fail or drop the ball and help them kind of get back on track because everyone has failures every now and again we don't want to have too many failures of course but you have to expect that every once in a while if your employees are really trying to kind of push themselves and not just come in and do business as usual or do things the way we've always done them before guess what they're going to have failures and they're looking to their boss to be there to lift them up to help them overcome those obstacles for example, respondents least likely to exit their organization strongly agree with the statement, I can easily approach my manager to ask for help, while respondents most likely to exit the organization disagreed with that statement. So, if they do not have that psychological safety there, what is the likelihood that they are going to be able to approach you to ask you for help? Even if you say, I've got an open door policy, you can come and, and talk to me at any time, well, what have your actions told them about that? Have you really created an environment? Maybe even a better way to put this is, does anyone take advantage of that open door policy? How many people are actually taking advantage of it? That's what you have to ask yourself. There's a difference between saying you have an open door policy and cultivating an environment where people feel safe to ask those questions. Finding number three, the number one skill managers lack is team building. Hey, listen to this. I wasn't even going to talk about this. I haven't read this report at the time of this recording. I like to be surprised about these things. But I've got another free webinar coming up on February 26. How to run an effective team building workshop. Isn't that serendipitous? I swear I didn't set that up. <laughs> Um, the data shows that nearly 30% of employees believe their manager lacks team building skills. Even some managers rated good or world class by their employees lack this critical skill set. When asked what skills managers lacked most, employees also say providing feedback, time management, delegation, and communication are top manager shortcomings. The top five skills managers are lacking 28% team building, providing feedback 17%, time management 14%, delegation 11%, communication 10%, uh, and other 20%. Interestingly enough, when managers were asked what was top of mind as part of the 2018 people management study, team building didn't make the cut. Isn't that interesting? Listen, psychological safety not only has to do with the relationship you have with your employees in terms of do you have that uh, manager employee relationship that's grounded in trust. It also has to do with the relationship the employee has with their colleagues. 
with their colleagues. You want to create a psychologically safe environment for the team rather than just, you know, maybe maybe you have a great relationship with each of your employees, but if they don't have that team collaboration, that team cohesion, that team psychological safety, you are going to be leaving a lot on the table in terms of what they're able to achieve. Not placing value on strategic team building is a huge mistake that affects the bottom line. When teams are cobbled together, team members are more likely to struggle to communicate and collaborate. Organizations that leverage talent optimization use people data to predict team dynamics and evaluate candidates accordingly. Finding number four, less is not more when it comes to meeting frequency. Yo, uh, I already have thoughts on this. Let's see what their data says. Do one-to-one -one meetings impact how employees rate their managers? Yes. The study found frequency of one-to-one -one meetings do impact their manager rankings. Respondents were often were asked how often they meet one-on-one -on -one with their managers. Researchers then mapped meeting frequency to manager ratings. As the chart shows below, there's a relationship between the two. Manager rankings ratings jumped from 3.1 to 3.6 when managers meet with their direct reports monthly versus quarterly. Listen, like, I don't understand. And they don't even have weekly on here. Maybe, maybe they had weekly somewhere else. I guess not. But there, there's a, there's, I don't understand why managers don't take any time out to give their employees FaceTime. This blows my mind. In my, I, I think I actually saw another statistic from this and maybe their landing page for this that, you know, only like 34 percent, 30 some odd percent of managers meet with their employees on a weekly basis. That's what I always recommend, getting those weekly meetings. Listen, if you do not have 30 minutes per week to give each person that reports to you, you are just asking for trouble. One of two things is happening. Either you have not fully embraced the role as a manager and you're still acting like an individual contributor, or you haven't put enough hierarchy in your team and you need to start distributing responsibilities a little bit more. This FaceTime is essential. Let me tell you what I hear from employees when their managers are not meeting with them, at least on a weekly basis. My manager doesn't care about me. I never talk to my manager. I don't have FaceTime with my manager. They don't, they don't listen to my thoughts and ideas. Go on and on and on. If you aren't willing to carve out the time to give them at least a little bit of FaceTime, then you cannot expect to build that psychologically safe working relationship that we're shooting for. While meeting with direct reports one-on-one -on -one once a month should be considered the minimum frequency for good management, rankings are higher for those managers who meet with their employees on a daily or weekly basis. Huh, how about that? Developing leaders at every level of the organization is central to talent optimization and giving regular performance feedback is one method for helping employees grow. Finding number five, managers who leverage people, dat people data see higher rankings. Respondents were asked whether behavioral or personality assessments are used as part of the hiring process and if the organization uses assessments for post-hire or personal development. Okay, use this behavioral assessments for hiring, 3.7% yes, 3.3% no. Uses behavioral assessments post-hire, 3.8% yes, 3.2% no. As the data shows, when behavioral assessments are used to collect people data in the hiring or post-hire, manager ratings are higher. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, like I love the DISC assessment. Disc assessment is my jam for stuff like this. They're actually specific. Listen, there are all sorts of disc tests out there. Not all disc tests are created equal. No, 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 no. But the ones that are good are really, really good. And they provide you with amazing information about what the work styles of your employees are. What are they going to respond to in terms of a quality manager? What's going to motivate them? What, how you should delegate to them? How should you should develop them? How you should coach them? All these things. It gives you this really highly accurate insight and information into exactly how to adapt to work with your team. That's why in my manager mastery training program, every single person in the training program does a disc manager profile that specifically lets you know about your disc style. And they also have the option to do the disc profile with their teams and get highly accurate comparison reports to help them adapt their style to their employees. This is the very first thing we do. It is foundational to the whole program because everything is built on adapting to the needs of your team in a really highly accurate way. 
As the data shows, when behavioral assessments are used to collect people data in hiring and post-hire, manager ratings are higher. To truly optimize talent, managers must understand how individuals are wired to think and work. Behavioral assessments can create this understanding. That may be because assessments help managers understand how individuals are wired to think and work. When hiring, behavioral data is useful for determining job fit and team fit. Post-hire assessments contribute to greater self-awareness and can be leveraged to improve working relationships and to tailor coaching to individual preferences. Finding number six, the number of direct reports doesn't impact manager ratings. Isn't that interesting? You might assume that the more direct reports a manager has, the less effective they are at managing, but the research shows otherwise. Researchers found no relationship between the number of direct reports a manager has and their ranking as a manager. Well, I actually think that that's really good news. I don't like to see a manager directly managing more than like six to eight people. I just think it's too much at that point. And particularly in regards to the one-on-one meeting and that one-on-one FaceTime, it just becomes really, really difficult to dedicate that weekly one-on-one FaceTime when you have more than like six to eight people on your team. But listen, if you can do it, then, and you can do it well and your people are happy, then that might not be a problem. Finding number seven, there are more good managers than bad managers. Well, that's really good news. The good news is (laughs) sometimes I feel like I'm a psychic when I'm reading these reports and they say exactly the same thing after I just said it. The good news is there are more good managers than bad managers. As previously mentioned, respondents were asked to rate their managers on a scale of one to five with one being terrible, five being world class. Okay, so this is how they got that ranking about who's a good manager and who's not a good manager. About 60% of employees believe their manager is good or world class. The distribute of rankings are below. I guess, you know, it's hard though, because I, I, this is a self-assessment. It's kind of like, I hope they provided specific guidance for what does it mean to be a world class manager? What does it mean to be a good manager? What does it mean to be an average manager? Because there might not be consistency in how people perceive those terms. Um, so that's my, my question about this. But listen, you don't want to, let, let's not, let's not d- deny the, the rankings. I think it's actually a really good sign that most people are saying their manager's doing a pretty good job. Finding eight difference in age between managers and direct reports doesn't impact manager rankings. In the 2018 People Management Study found negligible differences between the average ratings for managers of different generations. If age of a manager doesn't matter, does the age difference between a manager and a direct report matter? While some believe younger managers cannot be taken seriously by older employees, the research reveals a different story. The data shows the age difference has no significant impact on how an employee rates their manager, but makes a manager terrible or great is based more on how they treat their employees. I think that's really good news. I think a lot of younger managers in particular get very self-conscious if they have older people reporting to them. And this is a good lesson that, listen, what you bring to the table is going to dictate your relationship, not your age. Don't let these things that you can't control, you can't control how old you are, you can't control what year you were born, you can only control what you're giving to the process. So make sure you're really cognizant of not allowing that to impact how you treat your employees if you happen to be younger. Finding nine, industry doesn't impact manager rankings. Despite claims that certain industries such as recruiting and marketing have better managers, the data shows that no statistically significant difference between average managers across industry. Where's healthcare? I'm always, healthcare is actually pretty high. Wow, that's surprising to me. Healthcare generally is one of the toughest industries that I work in, in terms of people having a a quality work experience. And so I'm actually really pleased to see that they're getting a high ranking. Now this is combined with life sciences. Not sure exactly what that says. Um, But listen, like they're, like they said, there's no statistical significant difference. And I think that that's actually really good news. All right. 
That's, and then we have our survey methodology. So if you want to know more about how they had that, they did this research, um, head over there. Uh, you know, if you want to get this report yourself, it's on predictive index. Dot com. Just Google their 2019 People Manager report and you'll be able to download this PDF and it looks like they have some of their back reports on here too, which is really, really great. Overall, I think there's a lot of good news in this data, good news for managers. The biggest things that stand out for me are the the, the stats around meeting and you know these one-on-one -on -one meetings. Listen, if you are a boss and you are not meeting frequently with your employees. It drives me crazy every time I hear someone say, I only meet once a month with my team or I meet quarterly with each member of my team. You're not meeting frequently enough. We live in an age today where people can literally pull their phone out of their pocket and get access to any information they want to get access to. If they have instant gratification in every area of their life, except being able to have FaceTime with the person that is responsible for their career, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit, exaggerating a bit there, but listen, managers have a really profound impact on people's lives. I always tell people, when you take on the responsibility of managing people, you're responsible for their life. Because if they have a bad experience with you, that's going to seep into every area of their lives. And one of the easiest things you can do, and this report backs it up, to start building those psychologically safe working relationships with your people is to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings more frequently. This is part of the job, folks. Part of the job of being a manager is to set your employees up for success in the organization. If you are not meeting with them one-on-one -on, -one on a very frequent basis, at least weekly in my opinion, they say monthly here, but I say weekly, then you are not setting them up to do their best work. So any one change I would recommend managers make, it's usually that one. Listen, that's all I have for today. I do hope I see you at this webinar on February 13th or the one on February 26th, completely free to register for. So head over to zenworkplace.com. And if you can't make the live webinar, go ahead and register anyway, because what I'll do is send out a recording of the live webinar pretty soon after the webinar is done. So you'll have that in your inbox and you'll be able to watch it at your convenience. If you have any questions or any comments about what I had for you today, go ahead, leave a comment. Let me know what you think.